this discussion. And uh, I don't really know much about this. I'm not an expert. I'm here to learn just as you are. But I'm going to have to be the bully to the speakers to let them know when their time is up. So uh, whoever wants to go next, I guess we're going to do it that way. And then I will let you know when you have like two minutes left. Somebody's going to have to fix them up. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dal Wood, as I've already introduced myself. Um, so I don't have any, you know, my talk might not be that uh, illustrative, but I'm going to speak to you about three, three important issues about drone strikes. First, why we should be concerned about drone strikes. Second, how the current pervasive narrative of U.S. citizen victims skews these concerns. And third, what international law says about the legality of drone strikes in states like Pakistan and Yemen. So why should we care? I think the most publicized reason is casualties. In the 10 years that have passed, at least 365 drone strikes in Pakistan alone have been launched, and they've killed about three to 4,000 men, women, and children there. The numbers for Yemen and Somalia are in the hundreds, but still quite high. U.S. casualties, at the same time, we know that drones have killed some U.S. citizens, but the numbers are much less. Uh, in 2011, three U.S. citizens were targeted in Yemen. One was Anwar al which many of you would have heard about, and his 16-year-old son a few days later, and a companion of his. Um, one thing that doesn't get publicized that well in the media is major economic and social costs in countries like Pakistan. So it's important to focus on the casualties, but there's a lot of issues going on beyond casualties that people aren't really talking about. For example, um, the regions that drones actually target are is a place in Pakistan called Waziristan. It's a tribal belt. There's no central authority there. The British could not conquer it. No, no superpower has ever been able to actually have any major influence there. Um, it, a tribal code functions there. Tribal elders maintain order. They've got a system of um, justice, which may seem very um, brutal here, but it maintains order, what is called Pashtun Wali. And since the drones have been launched, a lot of tribal elders have been killed, not necessarily by the drones, but by either the Pakistan army or suicide bombers who are angry that the tribal elders are complicit with the drones, allegedly, apparently. Um, and their deaths have actually caused a lot of chaos there. There's a newly published book that's come, come out recently. It's called The Thistle and the Drone which actually documents this complete breakdown of social order in this region. Major psychological trauma, again, this is documented by a study called Living Under Drones by New York University and Stanford University. Funeral group, people who have been attending funeral processions have been targeted. Uh, people who turn up at um, after a drone has hit a certain house to rescue people to provide first aid and whatsoever have been targeted in a kind of drone um, attack called double trap strikes, where you launch a strike, then you wait for people together to help other people who have been attacked, and then you launch another strike to kill the rescuers. Um, and finally, of course, all of this doesn't really bode well for the economies of these extremely poor regions anyway. These are particularly, particularly poor places. There's no schools there, there's no hospitals. And of course, if drones are being launched on an almost daily basis, it doesn't really help the economy over there. Um, another reason we should be wary is, of course, it doesn't really make good policy. Now, as I mentioned, the tribal code, Pashtun Wali, when a member of a tribe gets killed, the clan actually has to take it upon themselves to take revenge from whoever killed uh, killed the tribesmen. And of course, it's not really feasible for them to take revenge from an American sitting many thousands of miles away. But you can imagine the kind of resentment and the angst that it holds in them. Um, and there's a lot of resentment that's um, going on now. Some people have said drones have actually replaced Guantanamo Bay as the most effective recruiting sergeant for Al-Qaeda. Now, I've spoken about costs, but I mentioned citizenship. How does citizenship actually fit into this picture? Well, it's quite bizarre that the current, uh, all the current debates about transparency and constraining drone warfare seem to be about focusing on U.S. citizen deaths. Now, that's, that's important. Let's not get that wrong. But the leaked Department of Justice memo, congressional oversight, Senate oversight, ACLU litigation, National Security Court, Rand Paul filibuster, everything has to do with when and where U.S. citizens can get killed. This is despite the fact that over 99% of people that have been killed in drone strikes are not U.S. citizens. Mm -hmm. It's probably at most, from the public information, four or five U.S. citizens that have been killed. 
as compared to about 4,000 non-US citizens that have been killed. Uh, so I think it's it's quite it's I think that kind of narrative needs to be resisted. The narrative of focusing on citizenship to demarcate the legal boundary of whether drone strikes should occur or when they should occur, because the victims aren't actually U.S. citizens mostly, um, and it's especially concerning because, in my opinion at least, there are some constraints that the government ha has has uh, constraints on government action when it targets U.S. citizens political democratic pressure, congressional oversight, domestic law, constitutional rights, big people who, um, relatives of victims who have been drawn victims have actually gone to courts over here. So the government, when it attacks uh, US citizens, it has to be quite careful. They can't just go and attack, attack people at random. This isn't actually true when it attacks non-US citizens. There's no recourse. In Pakistan, the government wouldn't care less about people, uh, its citizens dying. The same of Yemen and Somalia. So there's absolutely no constraint when the U.S. uses drones in these countries. Uh, it's important that people over here realize this because I think the narrative over here is of the drone being an extremely precise surgical device that only kills the bad guys. I mean, John Brennan is on record for saying no civilian has ever died. This was two or three years back. So in eight years, no civilian has ever died. And the New York Times obviously reported that how they count civilians is anyone of military age, which could be 12 years old, roaming around an area where a drone, drone strike is going to take place is not a civilian, he's a combatant. So of course no civilian is going to be dead if that's the kind of metric you use. Um, so now moving on to international law, what does international law say? Well, international law does actually impose a lot of constraints on any state using force in another state. There's international humanitarian law and then there's other rules which, um, which obviously say that um, force can only be used in self-defense and only to repel an armed attack. Um, and these constraints don't depend on whether someone's a U.S. citizen or not. The problem though is international law is weak. It's weak and it's vague, and that means it's open to many subjective interpretations. So we see, not surprisingly, since 9-11, that the U.S. has advanced all kind of, kinds of novel and unconventional uh, legal justification for going to war in Iraq, for using drones, for taking the war in Afghanistan to Pakistan and so forth. Um, specifically with regards to drones, uh, the U.S. government has been claiming that it can launch missiles, drones or cruise missiles or what have you, in any country in the world, not just countries where it is at war, for example Afghanistan, as long as that state is unwilling or unable to prevent threats to the U.S. Mm. Now that's not attacks, that's not 9-11, that's not armed attacks, it's any threat, threat that may be imminent. I think it's quite obvious that it's a pretty vague limitation to be able to uh, repel use force for any attack that is imminent. Um, and it's of course a very controversial claim even legally. The standard, the unwilling or unable standard is not settled in international law. Um, and the International Court of Justice, which is also popularly known as the World Court, has on two occasions explicitly refused to recognize such a right. Most international law scholars, at least outside the US, overwhelmingly are against having such a doctrine, the unwilling or unable doctrine. And and there is no charter right in the United Nations Charter for having such a doctrine. Mm. All in all, five countries in the world, I think it's Israel, the US, Turkey, the UK and France, that have ever used the unwilling or unable doctrine to justify their attacks in other countries. Um, and last week, in another blow to this doctrine, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Counterterrorism, Ben Emerson, categorically stated that drone strikes violated Pakistan's territorial integrity and sovereignty. So the question of legality isn't really in doubt. No matter what the government says, the majority opinion is against the legality of such strikes. Now, I'm not trying to be an... I, I, I think it's... I don't want to be an idealist. I think we've got to be pragmatic about the options that there are. Sometimes it may be necessary to use force across borders, but I think those are very, very rare occasions. Um, and that isn't the case right now. The way it's used right now is with complete impunity. There's no accountability domestically or internationally of cross-border uses of force. And it's, it's and an acknowledgement that counter-terrorism, counter-terrorists might actually uh, use force or be planning attacks from weak states or failing states does not necessarily translate into the view that the United States or any other state should have the right to launch a drone halfway across the world targeting, um, targeting civilians in the process. There's better ways to do it and uh, it is a challenge for international law how that's done. Um, in a paper that I'm, I'm, that's being published next, later this month, 
I've actually argued that the United Nations Security Council, as was mentioned by Dr. Solomon, not an ideal body, but much better in the current situation, should actually be have some kind of international legal oversight over the uses of force in failing states. Uh, well, I recommend. Right. I, I think there should be some legal oversight at the international level of drone strikes, and I propose that the United Nations Security Council should have some of a, somewhat of a, if not a say, then at least in making things more transparent of when is it that a state such as Somalia is failing in its duty to prevent attacks, or is the U.S. just making up, is it just being reckless, is it just acting on failed intelligence? It might not be a proposal that's acceptable to many people in this country at least, or to many powerful countries, but I think it's a far better, it's far better than the current situation where there's zero accountability. So I'm proposing the UN Security Council having some of us say. Um, it has both the institution and the legal capacity to do so, and it has done similar kind of things in the past. With that, I'll, uh, I'll wrap up, and I look forward to discussing some of these issues in more detail over the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, whoever would like to speak next, please just introduce yourself again. Hi, uh, my name is Joy First, and I'm from Madison, Wisconsin, and I'm really happy to be here with you all tonight. Um, just a little bit about myself. I'm a grandmother, a doll maker, a, um, I have my PhD in women's studies, and I'm a peace activist. And that's what I spend my time doing. Um, I've been involved with a group called the National Campaign for Nonviolent Resistance since 2003. And in that time, I've been arrested more than 30 times uh, acting in resistance to the crimes of our government. I'm going to talk about a couple of different things tonight. First, the, the role of Obama and the erosion of the rule of law in our, in our um, country. Uh, the president says that drones are a good thing because we don't have to risk the lives of our soldiers in battle. And he also says that we are using drones to kill terrorists and making the world a safer place. He makes the claims, and, and some of these points are ones that, that you, that you just made that I, I am just kind of reiterating that he claims that Drones make precision strikes and they only kill the bad guys. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of credible groups that are arguing that this just is not true. Um, there's a really good study from the New York University and Stanford University Law Schools that um, that talk about what drones have been doing in Waziristan and um, how they're terrorizing a whole civilian population, just totally changing the culture there. And um, also, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism is a, a um, group in, in um, Great Britain, and they've done extensive studies on what the drones are doing. Um, there's a handout that you should have, and there's a bibliography on one side where there's links to the Bureau of Investigative Journalism and, and a link to that study by uh, New York University and Stanford law schools, and, and that's a really great study to look at. It's really, it, it just gives a lot of good information about what's really going on over there. Um, so they say that many innocent people are in fact dry, dying from drone strikes. Nevertheless, Obama has steadily increased the uses of drones. Um, Obama ordered his first drone strike on about his second day in office, and I believe on that day he became a war criminal. Drones are being used as a tool to expand the U.S. empire around the globe, and our government acts as a bully. Um, there was just some information that came out that now the United States is thinking that they are going to determine the, the rules, the way that drones are going to be um, used throughout the whole world. So we just think we can make the rules for everybody. We can control everybody through our use of force. Obama is making decision on who lives and who dies, and every Tuesday he has a meeting with his advisors where he looks at a kill list, and he makes the decision that these people will be killed with the drones. Um, there's no due process. There's no accountability. This isn't what our country is supposed to be about. The power of the president, the powers of the president are expanding in a way that um, goes way beyond what it's it says in the Constitution, and we should be really concerned about that. 
Um, the, the other thing I wanted to talk about is moral concerns, the human cost of drones. And, um, you know, I think drone warfare is really hurtful to the people of this country in general as we become further detached and removed from the tragedy.